Good morning, everyone. This is the February 16th meeting of the Elementary School Building Committee. And seeing that we do have a quorum, I am going to uh, call the meeting to order and make sure that the members of the committee can hear and be heard. And um, I will just do what I've, my practice has been, I will call on people based on their faces on the screen. So in the order I'm seeing them. Jonathan? Morning. Morning. Paul? Present. Simone? Here. Deb Leonard? You have to unmute, Deb. You can hit the space bar and unmute you. Good morning. Good morning. Present. You and I just want to welcome Deb Leonard. She is joining us as the member from the school committee. Her appointment came first from the school and then through Paul, through the council. So she is joining us. And I spent a little time with her, but as needed, we'll spend more just on making sure she knows where we are in the process. Jennifer. Good morning. Angelica. Good morning. Alicia. Here. Great. So um, as people join, I will make sure they hear us too. So Margaret, um, I'm turning it over to you for the agenda. And we have a we have a fairly packed and and a diverse agenda this morning. So Margaret, you I'm Yeah, so I'm gonna quickly share the screen, talk through the agenda. Um okay, so we're gonna, I'm gonna do my usual start with looking at the overall schedule for the next three months. We're gonna give you an update on permitting. To the good news is like, all is good with permitting. Results of bidding, all is good with the results of bidding. Um, we're gonna talk about the two playground equipment working groups meetings that we've had. The design subcommittee meeting did not happen because of the snow, the, the um. snow snow day so that's been rescheduled we're going to skip that item for now we're going to talk about the proprietary items vote that is scheduled uh, to be taken up by the school committee on march 19th and we can go into a little detail on why that school committee not building committee um and we have some invoices so i'm going to take this down and i'm going to put up something else Kathy, um, it looks like Rupert and Allison joined us. Oh, thank, thank you, um, Donna. So, Rupert, I'm just going to call on both of you to make sure you can, we can hear you and you can hear us. Rupert? Hi, everybody. Sorry I'm late. Welcome. Allison? Hello, everyone. Thank you. As always, thank everyone for joining a Zoom meeting this early on a Friday. Thank you. On the Friday before vacation. <laughs> <laughs> when things get really crunchy, so. Okay, can everyone see this schedule screen with which hopefully you're now familiar? Okay, so um, taking it from the top. So we're actually here in this column, but I want, I'm looking back a little bit because a lot happened since the last meeting. Um, but uh, you saw this week that we did send out the recommendation to uh, the low bidder, which we'll talk about in the meeting. So looking backwards, um, you know, we got the, the bid documents went out for the early package. Uh, we got the bids back. We had some um, permitting meetings that were successful. Playground working group looked, worked, met twice, and we got comments from the MSBA on our 60% set. So looking forward, on this line, this group has a meeting on March 15th, which you should have a hold in your calendar. Deb, I need to check and make sure I've added you to these invites. And we have a meeting on April 26th. So let me know if you don't have those in your calendar. The consultant team, um, we need to get respond. The MSBA's um, comments were very minor. Uh, in fact, mostly, involved asking for stuff we gave them in the past submission. Um, we're re about to start a really important part of the project, which is the pre-qualification for the building project. Um, and we'll be talking about that more. We can give you an update 
March 15th meeting. And then we have a, the 90% CD submission to the MSBA in late April. The early site package, um, well, we have we have we have we have a winner. Um, they are we're in the process of getting their contract executed. They are going to be filing for their permits. We are coordinating messaging to parents. We expect them to be site on site in mid early to mid March, and we're in the process of sc scheduling a groundbreaking event. So we don't have a date for that yet, but it's in the works. Permitting, I'm gonna leave that for later, but the, all, the news is, not, is all good. We'll be starting construction meetings with the Gagliar Ducci, the low bidder, um, in I think approximately in mid-April. Um, in terms of design coordination, um, there's a couple, well, there's, Rick and, and Tim, I believe this is correct. We still have um, hazmat sampling at uh, Fort River going on during the school vacation. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. And then we've got this rescheduled building design subcommittee on uh, sale landed on February 28th and the third meeting of the playground working group on March 1st. Um, in mid-March, we have a meeting with the school committee on the proprietary items, which we'll talk about during this agenda. And we are still trying to land a date for the next sustainability subcommittee. Um, the MSBA, um, they are really at this point, they've gotten our comments, their comments back to us. We need to respond to them. So any questions about that before I take that down? I see Margaret, Kathy saying, yeah. Ma Margaret, my, um, I, I, I wanna make sure we send this out to everyone so that they yeah. have a paper copy of it. But the other thing is, are you gonna be going over the early site visit packet in more detail or yes. was that, okay. So, yeah, um, and similarly, my understanding after from a brief conversation with you on the sustainability subcommittee, we're waiting on a few things um, to be able to schedule that. So are you going to be are we going to be talking about that later? So I don't raise I won't raise questions now. We will the we don't have anything to discuss today about the sustainability subcommittee. OK, so my understanding, just so people know um, the the waiting to schedule it is we are looking at plug load analysis and a couple other items. So making sure it's scheduled at a time that makes sense is my understanding of why we've right. got to be proposed rather than an exact date. Is that that's correct? Right. Yeah, well, that's, I think that's the, we're sort of, we're all in agreement. That's the key piece of the next meeting. And Thornton Tomasetti is working on that, but it's not finished yet and ready for prime time, so. Okay. Um, I, I see, see Rupert's hand. Rupert, Rupert and Paul's hand up. Rupert? Yep. I just want to, uh, can you clarify for folks who would be uh, attending the weekly construction meeting? Thanks. For the I believe, um, Paul, tell me if this is correct. I believe the intention is for Bob Parent to attend the weekly construction meetings on behalf of the town. And I yes. apologize if I've got that wrong. No, I think that makes sense. We, we haven't had that conversation internally yet, but yeah. Yeah. So sometimes if I could just interject, it might be great, um, either Rupert or Tammy, um, maybe to be involved um, as well, because there may be in stuff that's going on that might not be working or, you know, Tammy should be kept informed, but that's, that's Bob Perenz position as well but sometimes we like to invite the principal that but we can talk sense. offline and, and we talk about any interface with the school first so they can scoot, uh, yeah. scoot afterwards oh well, that's great thank you yeah two things one is i do think someone from the school should be invited to those meetings um just because it's on site on the existing side of the schools, right. there's going to be impact no matter what. So they, someone from the school should be present. The second thing is, uh, Margaret, just make sure that I, I didn't really see this in the packet, but if this document, if we're sharing, it should definitely go into the packet. So it's mm -hmm. a public, public document. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we're, 
Rupert, just so you know, we're looking at at having those meetings on Tuesday afternoons, the construction meetings. So take a look at your schedule and let us know if that works for you. I will say that, I mean, typically what we would do is we would have a, an item on the, at the beginning of the agenda that would be about coordination with the schools so that the folks from the schools can attend the beginning of the meeting and any sort of um, issues can get sorted out um, and they don't have to stay for the whole meeting, so. Okay, I'm not seeing any more so hands. Senya's hand is up, Margaret. Oh, sorry, Ksenia. Uh, you, so have, you have a picture like Angelica's where it's really hard to see the background. Oh, sorry, well, okay, I'll do this. Um, so I, I, I'm organizing the meetings and I'll be reaching out to the contractor as we go into construction. Um, I'll be <clears throat> more and more involved here. Someone from the school will always be invited to the meetings. I also want to say that when there is specific coordination needed, you know, traffic pattern changes, any sort of interference with um, operations, any sort of specific issue of coordination needed, um, we, that will be highlighted so that the folks from the school know that that's a day that it's important to attend. And then there'll be lots of meetings when it'll be, okay, we've got our pattern established, week over week, no big deal, you could come or not come. So you will never not know that this is the time to talk. And if that meeting is not the convenient moment in that critical moment, we will set up a schedule, a separate meeting topic specific to make sure that those operational impacts are managed well and well communicated. Thanks. And so Margaret will send what she just had on the screen directly to everyone and as well mm -hmm. as uh, send and it to, to, to Angela. Angela. Angela to post it. So one of the things that she went quickly over is, um, and we're about to talk about the, the early site package, is some kind of groundbreaking event. And I think Margaret, you're gonna, she's gonna try to coordinate with a few people to pick a date for that, that the town council has asked about it a few times that, that we would know about it in advance. Clearly Deb, the school committee would know. So it's it's uh, trying to pick a, a time that would work for as many people as want to, who go out and say, this is the beginning of the project. It's pretty exciting. So. So it's that, and, and we will just, we'll just email everyone once we find a date to make sure anyone, all, any one of us who wants to come with children or depending on what time of day it is anyway. So it will be an event. So I'm turning it to, to the next piece, Margaret. Yeah, I think um, what we were gonna do next was talk about permitting and I'm going to turn this over to Denisco, who have led, and I have mostly listened into um, the planning ZBA and CONCOM discussions. Sure. Uh, thanks. I, we can expand upon the headline that uh, everything is good, uh, which it is. Um, so we had a zoning board of appeals meeting, um, the waiver that we required to build in the flip from conservancy passed. We had a few waivers in front of the planning board, uh, which they have granted. Um, the hearing was closed on February 7th. Um, we are awaiting their final conditions. Um, there were a few conditions, however, uh, that made some changes to the design. And I am going to share my screen and go through that with you. Uh, so the most impactful, um, where we had previously shown canopy mounted, um, PV over the parking lot in the Southwest corner here, uh, was a little bit into the property line setback, which happens to be doubled for, uh, educational use. Um, so it's, it, uh, rather than seek that special permit or waiver, we have moved that collection of canopies in two pieces to over the van drop-off loop at the southern drop-off and the part of the parent car drop-off immediately north of the main entrance. 
So here we have a couple of views of what that will look like. Uh, the PV canopy over the van drop off will provide cover as you get out of the vans. And then looking across the main plaza toward the front entrance, this canopy was moved from the other side of the parking lot. And again, this offers a little bit of cover for parents as they pull past the door, as they will be directed to pull past the door by school staff to make sure that everything flows uh, on site. There were another few conditions uh, related to the layout and details of the parking lot uh, that the planning board would like to see to revised. A couple we have included and one we need to talk about with the larger group because they left it to the uh, discretion of the school building committee whether or not uh, we would make that change. So in these sketches, you can see um, changes that we are incorporating in our documents. Uh, one, the paved area under the relocated uh, canopy will be expanded a little bit so that uh, at least half of the bike racks will be under cover. Uh, which was a suggestion of the planning board and we think is uh, a beneficial move for the project. They also suggested that we add an island in the northern part of the parking lot. Um, this is an opportunity for planting, another area where we could stripe a crosswalk and break it up a little bit, uh, but it does come with the drawback that it makes plowing a little bit more difficulty. And this island um, was the one that the planning board left to the discretion of the school building committee. Uh, I can just go through the other couple changes and maybe we can loop back to that to talk about it. There was also some planting that was required, uh, some screening along the edge, um, basically to block headlights from going into uh, neighbor's yards. Um, and so we've agreed to plant, I believe it's 13 more red cedars along this line. There is already a change in grade that effectively blocks headlights uh, from going into the yard here, but uh, it, it, this is a sort of belt and suspenders measure that we make sure that those uh, conditions are satisfied. Here's a closer sketch of what that will look like. And then one more change, uh, and this we are incorporating. There was a crosswalk across the southern bus loop uh, so with pedestrians coming in on the south side of the entrance, and so they would cross here to get to the school. And then the connection around the entire site continues. Uh, but this was a striped uh, crosswalk with uh, ramps to the curbs. Uh, this is now going to be a raised table intersection, um, so there is uh, going to be a bump. It will also calm traffic, uh, but it will be uh, that much more obvious when pedestrian students are crossing. Uh, the traffic will have to slow down, and this is a limited traffic entrance, but uh, every layer of safety we can add to the project, we will do. Um, so. Tim, that that really, that's just the bus drop-off loop, right? That's this the is bus just, the bus, just the bus yeah. drop-off loop. So those changes we are making with the exception of this traffic island, um, which we told the planning board we would bring to the school building committee for an opinion on whether or not. Uh, the pros, it's a little more opportunity for planting. It does break up a lot. We, If we do add it, we would not lose any spots. We would just the geometry of the curves at the north. Um, but uh, really, it's a question of whether you think this is a benefit to the design. Uh, Kathy, you have your hand. Uh, yeah, and, and actually I'm going to defer to Paul and Rupert because I think I listened in on the planning board discussion and at least one of their members raised the how hard it is it to how hard it is to plow, maintaining it, um, some other issues about it. And since it's left it at our discretion, Paul, I'm going to turn it back over to you, but it, it was it, it was it was raised as pot potentially not needed, but maybe rather than required. So I, I don't have an opinion about that 
and Kathy, I defer that to Rupert too. He's the one that's responsible for it. The question I had, it just remind me, do we have any other traffic calming um, speed humps or anything in, in this? I don't remember. Uh, we do in the, this crosswalk in the center uh, going all the way east-west is a raised platform. So, so that would minimize people sort of speeding through there? Yes. Good, thank you. Rupert. Cool, thank you. Um, so uh, once again, you know, my concern with, with plantings is uh, who's gonna maintain them? How do we keep them looking, uh, looking good? Um, uh, it, uh, and I guess the other concern I would have about an area like that is <clears throat> if a plow does hit something, you know, are there plans for any lighting or, uh, water or anything like that there that we might damage if, if we do push a big pile of heavy snow into something? And then another point I should bring up, a member of the planning board is also a member of the solar advisory committee. I don't know that I have that name right in town, but uh, she pointed out that the northern end of the parking lot is a prime location for future expansion of PV. If it will not be necessary to bring the school to net zero, but it is an opportunity in town. So if that were to happen at some point, this would obviously not be an opportunity for planning you know, just for full context of the discussion. Now, I guess my reaction, I'm just going to jump in. Um, Rupert still got his hand up. So Rupert, do you ever want to comment on that? Uh, I guess, I guess I didn't really give a clear opinion. I raised some questions, um, uh, but I could actually give an opinion that, uh, you know, I'd rather not see it there. I think it just makes maintenance it's it's more load on maintenance both for the plantings and the plowing. Thank you. That, thank you for doing the opinion because it strikes me the same way. And um, Sean had one point earlier raised potentially more canopies. Um, it got raised again. I think we're going to have a brand new parking lot with an opportunity if we wanted to use outside money to do more canopies where we can't put them on right now in the high school parking lot or the middle school parking lot because the parking lots have to be paved first. So I think not erecting barriers that would just be undone makes sense to me. Um, you know, there were a lot of questions on how many parking places and we the answer was basically the same answer that was given to us as the school building that these the number the count of parking places came from the schools so we we have the part that we have this parking lot so i think uh, it makes sense not to do the island but i'm waiting to see if there are any other reactions paul i agree Do, do you need us? Do you need us? And Jonathan, here's Jonathan. I, I don't see this as a particular need, that that particular one. Um, I think we could live without it. So, so do you need us to vote on it, Tim, or do you need us to basically say, you know, keep the existing design? Don't don't put the island in. How do you want us to deal uh, to? Uh, you're we you're muted. I don't think we need a vote. You've spoken pretty clearly, but if you want to vote to make it official, um, but uh, basically we're not making a change. So I, I don't know that we need a, a okay. vote to not make a change. Does anyone- anyway, We also don't have a vote on the um, agenda. That'd be fine. I just, does anyone have a comment in favor of this, I guess, to just, so we can then close off this discussion to say, in favor of putting the island in as opposed to not putting it in. I don't see anybody's hands up. Okay, so I think we we don't have to make that change. That's great. Tim, just, just to follow up on that, do we need to go back to the planning board just to let them know we're not going to um, take action on that or, or we just keep going? Um, 
we we are having continuing discussions with the planning board about the conditions and that was the one last thing i was going to bring up so one i will let them know that we are not making this change so that there is no mention of it in the conditions the one thing that is not resolved is um their initial draft of the conditions for the building um required more mechanical screening than is currently in the design so uh this is a, a, a view that we created just to have a discussion with chris Bestrup, um about what is screened and what is not um from where um so this is just an informational looking from the what will be the bus entrance at about the intersection with um, Southeast Street. Um, you're about 560 feet from the building. Um, it's a little um, blurry because you're so far away, but um, this rectangle is the mechanical equipment that's on top of the gym that is screened. This is the stair that goes to the roof and this is where Duct work from other equipment on the high roof goes into the building, but it has a, an architectural cladding, so that is screened. So from this entrance, from the public way where you can see it, the equipment on the roof is behind an architectural screen. Um, and then we have had discussions with the building committee in the past, uh, you know, early on, if it was acceptable to see equipment from the site. Um, so we're going to go to some other views. So here we are. None of the uh, playground equipment is modeled here, but this view is from taken from about the northern edge of the playground. And you're looking at the uh, cafeteria library classroom to the left. These rectangles that you see uh, are the top of unscreened mechanical equipment. Uh, so you will see them. Uh, as you get closer to the building, they will disappear behind the roof edge. But as you go further back, all the way to the, here we are north of the um, softball field at the path that goes along the northern edge of the site. So here you are, you know, over 600 feet away from the building, uh, and you're looking at the a pretty oblique angle. Uh, but this is up within a foot or two, uh, we don't know until we have the final uh, design of the equipment, the height of what you will see from this angle. If you move to the right to the public way at the entrance to the site, um, you won't be able to see anything but the very end of the building uh, because it's blocked by neighbors and trees. Uh, so none of this equipment will be visible from the street. So this is the last thing that we need to uh, negotiate or resolve the planning board what their requirements are we've given them uh, proposed language uh, that basically complies with what we've um, presented so far saying that any equipment that's at x number of feet 25 from the roof edge doesn't need to be screened and that would accomplish these goals but we have not heard back from the planning board on on that condition yet so, Rupert, uh, Tim, uh, if we were to add more screening, would that have an impact on the availability of space for TV panels and access for servicing equipment? It would have an impact on the availability for PV, certainly. If we were required for any reason to add screening, we would design it such that access to equipment was not uh, impacted, uh, but as it would um, decrease the area of PV, it would also increase cost. So I mean, uh, that's obviously else, something else we would have to consider. Thank you. Um, okay, I'll raise my hand and then call on myself. So I don't see anyone else. Um, when I looked at the part that's screened, screening will also have a something higher than the rest of the building. So to me, visually, I'm not sure if I'm 600 feet away and there's screening on top of the building versus equipment. I'm not sure how much difference it makes to me visually because it's 
it's it's not another floor on top of the building. So I think of it, you know, houses have chimneys on top of them. Um, so so Jonathan's more an architect. He'll he'll be able to tell me, but it's not clear to me what kind of visual impact not having screening versus having screening, what whether it's an improvement or not. Jonathan's hand is up. Yeah. So, um, I, Kathy, I agree with you. I think, you know, they've done a good job. My personal opinion is they've done a good job balancing screening from the public way. Um, I think from, you know, on the site from six, 700 feet away, uh, you're not going to read a vast difference between what's screening, what's equipment. Um, I personally don't think there's, there's a value to the project for additional screening, um, if we're really trying to protect something from from that far away, uh, buildings have things on them, <laughs> including PV, which at 600 feet you might catch some of that too. Um, and I, you know, I, I think they've done it. I think our design team has done a reasonable job. Um, we'll see what the the planning board has to say. No, and and Tim, I also think. Uh, Rupert's question about PV and cost needs to con be conveyed back to them because it's um, if you're not if you're really not getting much of a difference, spending more money on it and uh, getting in the way of things that we know we want to do and spend money on doesn't make sense to me. Yep. Uh, and I will say that the the planning board was not adamant uh, that everything be screened, but you know there was a discussion. And it was in their initial condition. So I, I, I think, you know, the, the the opinion of the school building committee, which they've deferred to on other things, will will certainly hold weight. But uh, I just wanted to present that it it is still uh, an issue. Yeah, and I I just want to chime in and say it was interesting to listen to because it was in the context of saying we expect this of private developers. We need to apply the same standard. So. That was that was where the conversation started. So, Jonathan, is your hand back up? Yeah, it is. Uh, you know, and I was going to kind of chime in on that that notion. Is there absolutely something they expect of private developers? I think it, what might be um, an interesting conversation with them is that the scale here is different than, um, and the type of thing they're trying to screen is different than what they would be asking of private developers. You know, most often this gets applied in the context of, of you know, of multifamily housing where you have um, what might be dozens and dozens of little tiny units, uh, helter skelter along a roof that don't look particularly good. Whereas in a large building setting like this, um, you're trying to screen not a unit that's four or five feet tall, but a unit that might be eight, 10, 12 feet tall. Um, and to me, it's, it's it, you know, it gets to a point where the screening get, could get to a point where it's calling more attention to the object you're trying to hide than the object itself. You know, I think the other issue is I, <clears throat> I, I, I struggle with these screening requirements because in, in, in the sort of common, but they don't really say what the intention is. I mean, generally I think of the intention of this kind of screening is if you're in a more urban condition, um, you're sort of screening it from, you know, views of a, adjacent folks, right? You're, you're trying to make it so like someone who's in a building next door isn't looking at it and or it's about sound. So in this case, you know, they're distant views. Um, you know, you're not, it's just, it, it, you, I feel as though they should go back to what the intention is a little bit in evaluating this, so. Uh, yes, and and by our reading of of the zoning bylaw, it's not explicitly clear that you know what Jonathan said about the intention sort of reads in the language of the bylaw, and it's not explicitly clear that it actually would apply to what we are doing here, given the distances and and the yeah. type of stuff that we're screening. But we, as soon as we know, we will certainly update it. Okay, so zoning, com com. Tree is, uh, it, yeah, uh, we've had so many hearings, we forgot to mention a few. Uh, we did have a tree <laughs> removal hearing. Um, the two um, trees at the northern end of the site, um, Alan Snow um, 
actually, he said that if the hearing was in a year or two, there wouldn't even be a hearing. They would just cut it down because for safety issues. But um, th those are going to be removed, and we are going to move the site as originally discussed. And CONCOM, we have the order of conditions, um, and it was included in the early site package. So all of our um, permits, regulatory issues that we have with the town, uh, we are in good standing with these few minor issues to resolve with the planning board. So we do need to come back to the Corkeen issue, but I think we should do it as part of the playground conversation. So um, Tim, if that's um, your full report on that, um, why don't we talk about the good news from the early site package? So um, Ksenia, maybe would you like to kind of give the report on the, the bidding and uh, where we landed? Of course. Um, we had a very strong response, eight bidders, um, very many of them very competitive, uh, the bulk of them below budget, although there were a couple of outliers, um, one on budget and two above, one, the, the high bid was double the low bid, um, so some spread, but there were a lot of bidders who were, that were clustered around the lower end. Um, and the low bidder stood out. Um, uh, they are around 600,000 below the estimated value for this package. Um, they are Gagliarducci uh, construction. They are <clears throat> local to the area, um, have very uh, excellent references, including references from uh, the project team who have worked with them before, but also references ca called from um, what they provided with their submission. Um, many of the other bidders were also you know, very qualified, reputable companies. So I think we were very fortunate in the bid response that we got and fortunate in landing both a um, competitive financially low bid and a very qualified company. Um, we've provided a recommendation to award to Paul a little, um, a few days ago, um, and are moving forward uh, with getting them on board. Um, I'll just say that the savings from this buyout um, will beef up the contingency, the so, sort of buyout pricing contingency, um, and will cushion um, the bigger bid package that will be coming up this summer for the whole main building and the primary general contractor. Um, so it's not necessarily savings that we should get immediately excited about spending, uh, but it's excellent news. So any questions about that? I'm not seeing any questions. Okay, okay, I've got a question. <laughs> I have less a question, more a comment. I think this is terrific news, um, including the news about savings. It, for me, uh, raised my confidence level in the cost estimators having recent data, recent enough data to give a pretty good get uh, estimate, knowing that in terms of inflation factors and increasing the cushion on contingency we have in the larger project is terrific. So I, um, I, I, when I saw this, I didn't, I wasn't sure it was local because the name it doesn't say Springfield, but it is a Springfield company, as I understand. It's a subdivision of Springfield. So I, I think the fact that they um, aren't driving here from Boston or somewhere else is is a good. Things since they're going to be bringing in dirt and taking dirt out. So it's a, a, re, a really good piece. So my, my main question is, at the point this starts, does the fence that goes up, is that the fence that will then stay up when building and everything else goes up, is question number one. Question number two is we've had at least one public comment on... Um, the poles out by the current softball field, will those poles be coming down during this? And if there's an opportunity, if someone wants to come and get them, I'm assuming there would be some way of doing that. But just as a sense, first, just on the fence. So when this fence goes up, 
is that basically the fence we're going to that be then seeing. So those so are my. I, I'm going to let Rick answer that question because I think that's why he's got to stand up. No. Uh, so the, the fence that goes up <clears throat> will stay uh, for the for the duration of the first phase of construction, but also be adjusted. There was a desire uh, that came up during the CONCOM discussions that the eastern bound of the ESP uh, site disturbance be contained. Uh, so the, the fence, <clears throat> we used a portion of the existing softball fence there for a construction fence, just so that that the ESP contractor wasn't ripping up the whole area all the way to the extent there. That that's the drawing, and then ultimately, uh, the next contractor, the general contractor, would push that extent out to the uh, east, uh, and then the section that's between the existing school site and the building we specify to be movable so they can move that in and out as they need it and they can use it uh, for when they have to fence off the demolition of the building for the next phase. So a lot of it remains, the answer is a lot of it remains. Uh, some of it gets adjusted outward when there's somebody who has the capacity to finish the soil um, work and create uh, final grades in the uh, buffer zone, which is the general contractor, not the ESP contractor. And this starts when it goes up. Um, I know, Rupert, you've been in meetings, but whatever traffic patterns will be changed, we there is a plan for that and people will be notified about that, correct? Uh, do it as a question. Yep, Paul is nodding his yet, head yes. Because yeah, that's, that's true. Kind of see where that goes in. Yeah. Before the fence goes up, there's going to be a bunch of stuff that'll be done first, so that we can change the traffic pattern uh, as smoothly as possible. And just to touch base on your uh, question about the uh, wood light poles, yes, they are coming down during the ESP project uh, as demolition. Uh, Basically, as, as de demolition salvage, they are the the uh, property of Gagliarducci. When we get to the job meeting uh, part of the project, we can ask them uh, if they'd like some place to take them, because I do think that somebody was identified that would be interested in them. But at that point, it would be helping Gagliarducci uh, find a home for it if they didn't have it already. Rupert, I see Rupert's hands up. Yeah, I think I think we already uh, uh, depart on a part departmental level, the school and uh, the DPW uh, decided that we didn't have a use for those poles. Uh, we were asked already and we said, no, um, they're too old and too beat up to uh, be functional for us. So we, we were offered them we turn them down is my understanding. Uh, it's more of, of, of an interest in, in, in sustainability, reuse and repurpose rather than, than relocate. So, so thank you. So it will be in, in the contractor's hands. So we just need to, to, to extent there's that interest there, there'll, there'll be an avenue. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions or comments other than Excitement. <laughs> this is this is a, feels like a real beginning. I don't see any hands. So okay. why don't we pivot to playground equipment working group? Tim, could you give us an update on that? We've had two really good meetings with the group. So Tim, you are muted. Thank you. I'm just going to share a site plan to give context for the discussion. Okay, so we had what are we? our second working group meeting, a uh, very good discussion. Um, we sort of 
narrowed in on an option uh, with some key edits uh, from the staff and members of the working group to make it more um, conducive to accessibility for all and yet uh, still provide the uh, play that uh, everyone can enjoy and, and use. Um, Megan O'Brien. Can, can I ask before you before you launch into the playground, can you just walk, particularly I think for Deb Leonard's benefit who hasn't seen this before, could you also give a kind of overview of the pieces of the overall playground? Yep. Uh, so the overall site, uh, the working group is about the playground, which is um, the equipment that will be in this area just north of the building. So yeah. uh, but this is the building, uh, the existing building taken down in this dash footprint. Um, the main entrance uh, is here. Um, and then circling around, we can go to the other site features um, as we go past the southern entrance of the building and the bus drop off loop. There are outdoor learning opportunities including a uh, pavilion, which is uh, basically a group structure for a class size group of kids, 24 plus teachers to be outside and covered uh, from rain or sun uh, and have an outdoor class meeting. Uh, adjacent to that, there are planter gardens, enough for two classes to be outside at one time uh, with planting and beds as part of the science curriculum. Adjacent to that, there is also a pollinator garden with native species. Um, and then moving around uh, to the right of the site here is uh, a microforest, a uh, forest floor garden. So it'll be saplings, um, native ground cover, wood chips, uh, and logs that can be rolled around so that uh, students can interact with plants and uh, creepy crawly things under the logs. Um, and then this is a rain garden, uh, which again will have native species, meadow grasses, um, and educational experience, but it is also part of the storm water management uh, system. It uh, retains water before it uh, is eventually discharged off site or infiltrated into the ground. And then interspersed with these outdoor educational um, opportunities, there are lots of play areas, including two basketball areas, two full-size courts here, and a couple of half-size courts facing each other here. Um, and then as we circle back, we get to the playground, which this will be a, a resilient soft surface that we will discuss today. Um, um, and that will have structured play uh, equipment throughout, including swings, climbing structures, ramp structures, uh, and, and a few other items. North of that, athletic fields that can be used for recess, gym class, and as a community asset in general. And then the entire site um, is ringed with walking paths that connect all the way up the southern entrance to Southeast Street uh, to the connection that goes north across the Hoare River up to the road. Um, and then at the playground uh, meeting last week, there was a discussion of uh, similar to the way we will mark games on the asphalt, um, four square, whatever the uh, current game is that uh, we choose, we could use the same sort of to mark waypoints or distances on the path around uh, to give something else for kids to interact with or walkers of the site. So that is uh, the larger context for uh, the playground, which is just north of the cafeteria. Uh, children exiting from the cafeteria at recess will be coming either here from the cafeteria door or uh, the central building door to the north of this. And then for the playground meeting itself, um, you know, we, we continue to work on the design. Um, I don't know that we need to share any of that because the design is not finalized yet, but we will be meeting again on March 1st with a uh, fully developed playground model that uh, the group can comment on. And we will also be providing information, uh, images of individual pieces of equipment that the members of the working group can sort of vote in or out uh, so that we can get all of the pieces that they want and meet the budget and fit within the space. Yeah, I just want to add, so the 
the working group is made up of um, Angelica um, from the committee is representing the committee. And then there are a number of folks from the district who are involved with um, PE, um, several folks involved with special ed. Um, the principals have not attended, but Doug has attended. And, uh, oh, and there's a couple of parents and there's some overlap. There's some parents who do, are also um, involved with the district. I see Deb has her hand up. Hi, um, thanks for all of this. Um, this is super exciting. Um, is there a track? There is not a track, a running track? There is it's, not. There's not a running track. and. What parts of the outdoor learning spaces are accessible or outdoor spaces are accessible to the students during recess? Obviously the playground and the fields, and I'm assuming the basketball courts. What about that outdoor learning center? Um, the extent, well, the outdoor learning center is imagined as uh, an educational, so classroom, so they would be supervised at any point in the day that they would go out with the teacher. Uh, mm -hmm. The extent that students would be allowed to go, you know, all the way from the west end of the playground to the forest or garden would be the purview of staff and, and how far they let the kids go. But in terms of accessibility, it is all at the same level. Uh, there there are no barriers to any of, of the it, the playground to the basketball players is flush the same with the um basketball courts um and then the rain garden here um there is a slope and there are rocks in there because it's a natural feature but we've included a viewing area for people to to see in from thank you kathy has her hand up uh Tim, when 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 Deb asked about a track, there is a uh, your cursor can show it. There's the the hard surface right near the playground. Everything connects to this uh, trail that goes all the way around. And so I think one of the suggestions was markers where uh, I don't know whether that's a mile all the way around or a half mile all the way around, but you would be able to say, you know, if you start here and go all the way around the outside and come back, you've now gone, you know, a half a mile, a mile. So you could potentially, it's not a track in quite the same way, but it's a fast walker. <laughs> it's a, a a distance metric. It, it, that's correct, right? Because you could put, I guess, along the yep. trail, it would be more like wooden sticks saying you're now at point number whatever if we wanted to do something like that yep that, that was well received at the playground working group um when our landscape architect brought up that idea so either it's markings on the path varies depending on where you are in terms of material but weight markers or markings on the ground itself and whether it's a distance so that you can count off where you're going or uh pointing to a feature i mean there's the fort river is to the east here or uh, there are wetlands to the north of uh, where the existing swings are now. So there are all sorts of features that could be pointed out as way marker, way finding points on this path that we can work on with the group. Deb. So in the uh, many schools, uh, in the tradition of schools of sixth grade, or I guess it would be fifth grade, doing... Um, gifts those might be nice gifts for the, the the classes to to present rather than a bench or a rock or something like that um two things um i want to just bring up here so one is we did get comments i think very concerned comments about the lack of containment of the playground. Um, Tim, could you ex maybe zoom in a little bit and expand on that conversation? Sure. So um, yes, one of, one of the staff, uh, several of the staff, um, you know, we're, we were reviewing the playground design and currently there is no fence as there once was around the playground. Um, and she deals with a uh, subsection of the population that is uh, 
sorry, I'm having trouble zooming. Um, prone to elope, uh, to run away, um, and and the lack of impediment to that um, was a concern for her. And she wasn't advocating for a fully enclosed playground um, as we once had, uh, but a barrier, something that would slow having trouble zooming here. And so in that meeting, uh, and since we've had discussions about what would be the most appropriate place to um, start and stop that fence, um, you know, a full loop around the playground is probably not necessary. Um, a fence to the north um, is just going to stop you from getting out of the field, and the field is a good long ways before you're off site. Um, and then a fence to the right of the playground is probably not necessary because there's more Try it this way. Sorry, we're we're having a bad day with the plan. <laughs> so, um, yeah, a fence to the right of the playground is probably just keeping kids from using the multiple aspects of the playground that are there and designed for them to use. So uh, we have to have further discussion to make sure that uh, those needs are addressed. And we also have to acknowledge that, you know, accessibility and controlling, um, you know, the ability of a student to run away are, are sort of uh, working at cross purposes. So um, there's a balancing act that we have to figure out here. Um, the, so the other, uh, two other pieces that are worth mentioning. So one is the, the budget that the committee is working within is the budget that was established by, um, the estimating process. So that value is $500,000. So, um, you know, I think we also kind of in the mix here is, um, trying to balance the, the needs of the teachers who are managing uh, kids who may be eloping and the budget. So not to say that we won't add something, but that's very much in everybody's minds. I think we should talk um, a bit about the Corkeen situation. Um, so you all remember um, this material being brought up. Oh, Alicia, I see your hand is up. Yeah, sorry. Is it okay if I just make a comment about the fencing before we move on? Yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, just because I think I was one of, I might have been the only one who advocated very heavily against fencing mm -hmm. um, at the playground. And I just want to be really clear about understanding um, some of the concerns that were voiced by the staff. And I do also want to share that I am parent of a child who has challenges with eloping. Um, mm -hmm. And so my kiddo is one of those kiddos in that programming. And I would prefer that we look at alternatives to fencing, such as like maybe additional equipment or things that could be used as a barrier as opposed to like a chain link fence, um, like maybe a safety net or like a climbing rope. I just think that there are other ways that we can create those barriers without putting fencing. And I would hope that the committee would be interested into looking into those things. That's helpful clarification, Alicia, to your perspective. Angelica's hand is up. Uh, yeah, thanks, Margaret. Uh, um, I think that from my from the discussion, the teacher that is in charge of the AIMS program and the uh, um, building blocks program that uh, is where that population um, concerns yeah. arise, um, emphasize the same thing, that it's not so much about a link, chain link fence, but really trying to figure out an alternative that would also be in keeping with the spirit of the playground and all this, like we have the logs, we have imaginative play, something like that. But like Margaret said, it puts us in a challenge with the budget. So it's something that I would also love to bring to the committee because one of the concerns expressed in the committee in the working group is that the $500,000 is tight, very tight, especially when we're looking at now um, doing some edits. And those edits are some of them, we have a lot of agreement on that, those edits. Um, and some of them may be 
we can't edit because we need to figure out how to deal with the elopement issue in a creative way, or we may need a new ramp for accessibility purposes. So it would be just great to put forward the issue that it, it may be that we need to think a little, have a little flexibility just like we've had in other areas with the budget and the tightness of it. So we make sure that we are not sacrificing safety for students, accessibility and the beauty and the exciting aspect that this playground will provide because it will be a big feature, not just for the school, but for the community as well. Thanks, Angelica. Deb? Hi, um, apologies for like adding my two cents as a brand new member, but um, going back to the previous playground, the one that was in existence before this one, this uh, wooden structure, the one of the great losses of lose, well, one of the great sadnesses of losing that structure was there was a platform where kids would perform and uh, especially the younger kids did a lot of creative play just because they could put on shows. And so, you know, if that would serve both purposes, it may not be all that expensive because it is just a platform <laughs> with mm -hmm. seating, just an idea. Thank you for listening. So um, I do, um, Angelica, I appreciate your perspective. I, I just want to restate for the committee what the, um, uh, how the, the, the budget was established. You know, we haven't, you, you will remember, we haven't ever made any value engineering changes to the budget for the equipment. The budget for the equipment that was established, not disagreeing that um, I think there have been comments about wanting to spend more within the playground subcommittee. The budget was established based on what comparable school projects, elementary school projects spend. So it was, it's sort of um, benchmarked against peers. Um, it's, it wasn't sort of conceived as a kind of a, lo a, low, a low number. So. Okay, so I wanna take up the Corkeen issue. Um, Tim, maybe if you could take this down. Um, we, so background, um, I'm sort of leading up to asking um, Denisco to provide their perspective about this. So you all will remember that this was, uh, the Corkeen material was brought up in public comment a few months ago. Um, we've done some research on it. Um, it was also brought to the attention of the Conservation Commission. Um, as Rick noted earlier, they did provide us, the Conservation Commission did provide us with the order of conditions for um, the larger site, which is allowing us to move forward with the early site package. But they held out, uh, they have not yet signed off on the playground because as it stands right now, the playground um, specifications use port in place rubber. So um, you, you will remember at the last meeting, I think it was, I sort of su submitted a sort of summary of what the research I had been able to do in the packet and the materials I sent out yesterday. There is uh, a document that uh, Denisco provided. So Tim and Rick, can I, could I ask you to talk about this issue? It, it's adjacent to the playground working group in the sense that they are really focused on equipment, but there are implications to equipment choices that are embedded in the potential for the use of Corkian. Uh, before you do it, Tim, I just wanna note that Doug has joined us and Doug, can you just make sure that we can hear you if you unmute for a second, welcome. Absolutely, sorry, Melina was stuck in a different meeting. That's okay, thank you, welcome, All right. Rick, do you want to? Um, no, it's the from a playground design standpoint, we're looking at uh, desired features. One is universal uh, accessibility of the entire surface, which is what the port in place uh, rubber surfacing provides, as does the core keen. 
the from a playground equipment design standpoint as we've been reviewing the uh, testing data, some of which is European uh, EN standards and not ASTMs that we're used to dealing with as far as resiliency and uh, shock absorption. It appears that it, it would be advisable to consider the fact that Corkeen might be uh, a little stiffer in cold temperatures and kids play all year round. And that might cause uh, equipment selection and design to have a lower fall height. There are, there are standards for uh, what kind of cushioning you need under pieces, uh, depending on what that piece is and, and how a kid might use it and how a kid might fall off of it. So, so limiting, making adjustment in, in heights, uh, would be a consideration for the equipment. And that's, and that's the, the one from a design standpoint, uh, the other issues with with core team that are frankly simply not known is uh the longevity in this climate and i don't know if you want to get into the 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 pros and cons or put the document up donna i can share uh thanks tim Rick, while she's doing that, in terms of height, um, my understanding is a lot, most, if not all, of the equipment we're looking at wouldn't be, it, it's, is it eight feet, you know, eight, not, you shouldn't be farther than eight feet. Are we lower on most of the equipment we're looking at so that height per se is not an issue? This is, well, this is a little out of my uh, okay area of expertise, but I have heard it said repeatedly that some things like swings are a piece of equipment where this could come into play and then the suggestion is well you could make a, a change of material under the swings and then you get into the more practical discussion about changes of, two things happen about that change of materials and that is uh that's basically where materials can use attention the accessibility maintenance and uh failure uh so optimally you have a single surface that extends over everything all the adjustments in both of these surfaces in cushioning actually the cushioning layer is under what you see and that thickness varies over over the the area of the whole playground where the kids could fall the farthest it'd be deeper uh so that's Rick, that. I think, yeah, I think, um, again, just to kind of preface all of this, this is a new surface um, in and around the United States, right? So I, I don't want to go all the way backwards. But I think what we heard was um, we eight, eight feet is is the maximum. Is that, Margaret, what you had? Well, I mean, again, this is... This is one designer's take because there's so there's nothing to rely on. There's one designer who is has designed and is there is an installation going in in Easton this spring, which is the first, I would say, significant use of corkeen in this area of, of straight corkeen, right? And it was that designer's analysis that they were not going to go above eight feet based on the information that they reviewed. So, I mean, the, the problem, the problem is just to be clear to the building committee about the, the, the dilemma that the design team has here, they don't really have much to rely on here. Um, the, the designer who is moving forward with this, in Easton did her own analysis and, and came to that conclusion. So um, this is, you know, the, 
one of the it's an issue with sort of using a new pr new product. I think in this case, Sinisco and uh, Brown Sardina together would have to come to that conclusion. But I brought that forward as a as a perspective from another designer. Angelica, a question? Yes, so two questions. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about anything you know in terms of accessibility, because I know that that was one issue is that with the with the wood composite, it's just not a stable enough surface for things like wheelchairs and the four in place was. Um, and I'm wondering about Corkeen. And the other one is about um, um, the climate resilience. Uh, my understanding was that Corkeen was something that had been um, first done in like colder climates in Europe. So do we have any data on how resilient it's been in those climates? So on the first topic of accessibility, it's my understanding that that's one of its great features. That it is equivalently, you know, it, it is a, a different material in a, set, a similar binder and it's being put down in the same way. Um, as, as poured in place. As poured in place, yeah. Right. Um, the, the oldest installation in Europe is was in 2016. That's as far as the use of the material goes back, which, you know, as Bill Brown has commented, I can't remember, he had this great line is like, he wouldn't typically, the landscape architect wouldn't typically specify something that hadn't been in use for much longer and have sort of eight to 10 comparable installations because there's risk associated for the design team. So um, 2016 and as far back as we can get with its use. And and that's, that was in Norway or something, well, Margaret? Or and it is in cold, cold climates, so that it is in cold climates. Well, yeah. right. Uh, yep. I don't know what the climate and the location in Norway happens to be. If it's if it's coastal, it may not be as severe as Amherst. Uh, so that's something that's beyond what we know what it was subjected to and how. Right, and and so it's also not necessarily just the cold right it's the swings it's the extreme colds and then you, oh. you get pretty warm in the summertime so so you know for us and maybe um pause his hand up i was going to say we can just go through our position and and we understand you all are being put in, in a difficult position as well um but maybe we'll just uh, let Paul opine first. Paul has his hand up. Kathy, has thank you. Hand. So, you know, I'm really eager to hear from the professionals' advice on this one. Um, I guess one of the questions is a more broad question: Can we, instead of um, specifying a product, specify performance standards that we want to meet, like? must be able to withstand a fall from eight feet, must be able to withstand weather conditions and, and things like that, and let the bidders put in whatever surface they want. We could put some ex exclusions in. We may say we don't want to put wood chips in or something like that. Um, but I'm wondering if we should just let people compete on this in terms of what the per and, and established performance levels that we'd like to see whatever the surface is meet. Does that, does that make things way more complex? I'm afraid, well, it makes it way more complex. Okay. It kind of turns it into the wild west of determining what these bidders base their bid on. And the other thing is um, by statute, we have to, uh, if you give a performance uh, specification, uh, it has to be able to be met by at least three manufacturers. Okay. And what we're saying right now is that of the monolithic surfacing, uh, all that we know right now is Corkeen and uh, poured in place rubber. And we don't know that you could make Corkeen perform like poured in place rubber by telling them they have to do this. Okay. Thank you. Unfortunately. Kathy? Uh, yeah, so. As I understand um, your brief summary of the Conservation Commission, they held this out because of their concerns. So I, my question is, do we 
We left this up to the designer last time. We took a vote on it. Two people were against Corkeen. We we gave full permission to go to Corkeen if, ne if needed to meet CONCOM concerns. If their concerns are such that we can't use poured in place rubber, so I'm, I'm asking this a question, then our choices are some combination of engineered wood fiber and corkeen. Um, and what I when I walk around our swing sets now, um, not just our swing sets, but some other places, they have some shredded wood under them sometimes. And every once in a while, there's a mat over the shredded wood, a rubber mat. But it looks like we're not very protected in most of our swings, you know, in terms of uh, a deep, uh, we've only recently been using poured in place rubber in some of our playgrounds. So my question is, how much leeway do we have that if CONCOM says you can't have poured in place? And their concern was the water percolating through the under the underneath. It's not so much the fall protection. So that it's because of the wetlands that we've got near us and because of the Fort River. So this wouldn't be overall never use it. It's because of this particular site. So is is that where, do we have a, a reading on them on, if if we don't really have a choice, it looks to me like Corkeen, I think Corkeen is potentially an exciting option. And I understand all the concerns about new new to New England, new to schools and new, et cetera, that you can't. You can't say we've done it in 15 schools and we love it. At Denisco, I completely understand that you've done it in no schools. And we found one school in Massachusetts that's about to do it, <laughs> you know, so. And they don't have swings on that playground. And they don't have swings, you know, and Margaret did um, further investigation on there's a huge playground in Philadelphia. So, again, a, a city, but it turns out they didn't do Corkeen deeply. They did poured in place rubber underneath Corkeen, some combination of it. Um, and it's new. Um, so, so that's, if, does CONCOM, we need the CONCOM permit. So are we up against CONCOM is driving this decision, is my question. I see Rupert has his hand up and, and Paul. So Rupert, you first. I don't have, sorry, I don't have an answer to Kathy's uh, question. Uh, okay, that's all right. Uh, I have a different question, which I suspect we don't have an answer to. Um, I understand there are environmental concerns about the rubber content in the port in place rubber, uh, and cork is a natural wood substance. However, do we know anything about the composition of the binding agents that they use uh, and any environmental concerns about whatever holds all that cork together? It's polyurethane. It's pretty much the same material as what's the binder for port in place rubber. So, so that what Rupert, what I was going to say is it's it's the same on both surfaces. Was my understanding? Yeah. And also, can I just say, Rupert, you raised a question at a previous uh, in our previous discussion. I want to come back to, but let, let's hear Paul's comment slash question, and I'll return to that. Yeah, so I just, and Kathy, you said the CONCOM is driving this decision. I'm just wondering, is that in their decision, written decision, or did they, are they, do they base it on evidence that this substance versus some other substance is worse or better? And like that there's actual evidence that this percolates to groundwater. Just don't be, I haven't been following this very closely, so I apologize if you're repeating things. No, Tim, and they pulled it out. They haven't made a decision poll. They pulled it out. It's not, a, so T Tim and Margaret can comment on it. They pulled it out as everything else is okay, but we want, we want, we're concerned about this. So they- Yeah, they commented in the first hearing on their concerns about it, um, suggested that it was a real sticking point without voting on it. And because we were on a rigorous timeline for the early site package, we asked that they consider at the second meeting, we asked that they consider separating the order of conditions from their opinion 
on the playground surfacing material. And that is what they did. They basically said, here's your order of conditions. It does not include our permission to proceed with the playground as it is currently designed. Angelica has a question. I did just to comment, I, I see in the memo, it says that the design team is not in a position to recommend Cortine, but it sounds that for environmental reasons, they're also, we're also like in a situation where we're not in place to necessarily go forward with pouring place rubber, right? So um, we're kind of stuck in a rock in a hard place. And uh, I'm just wondering, so what are we going to use to, to, to as a like a decision making mechanism here? Like we have just so many trade offs, but at, if I can just plug in my view as a parent with kids who still goes to the playgrounds a lot, um, the big, big issue that I saw with port in place rubber that a lot of other parents expressed was the heat and the chemicals. If you have littles in Groff Park trying to go through in a hot day, it's really hot and you know all of that we were trying to mitigate it with color and and so that's a big 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 concern it's a big concern to have um all that chemical being released and all that heat and it looks like Cortine is addressing some of that as well as the accessibility issues so what um what would we need to to decide or what would be the factor if, given that it's such a new material and yeah it would be a huge risk but maybe the benefits outweigh that risk well, uh, let me ask a question of Danisco very specifically. So my understanding of this memo is that you are not recommending this material and by implication, you are looking for direction from the committee on this. Is that correct? Yeah, it's it's cor correct. And um, Paul, I guess we would have to talk about this, but um, we, we are ha happy to go in the direction the committee is asking us to, but there has to be some form of waiver of responsibility should this fail. We, we, we can't take ownership or responsibility of this from a liability perspective. And, and we understand, like we totally, we understand Angelica, everything that you're saying. We, um, you know, in, in three years, this could be a different conversation, right? Like, uh, but right now from a liability perspective, we have to somehow um, be covered because we can't be responsible if this fails in three, three, four or five years. So Donna, would the form of that be that you would draft a waiver and ask the, the town to sign it? Yeah, I'd ha I have to talk to our insurance carrier to find out what it is that absolutely needs to be done, but yes. Okay. I think that is that is clarity. So Jonathan, you had a comment? Yes, it's 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 the support, you know, the design team's need for, for a waiver in this condition. Um, you know, any any responsible designer, you know, would be responding this, the same way. I, this is not in any way, you know, we shouldn't view this as in any way particular to our design team. I think they've done an excellent job of vetting uh, the products, but given it doesn't have the, you know, typical um, in place uh, experience in in this country in in similar climates, you know, personally, I'm I'm not particularly worried that it, that it failed, but it, it could fail from a product perspective. It could fail from an installer perspective. There's also a very limited pool of installers for this product. Um, and while I, I like the advantages that it provides when it comes to accessibility and lower heat, um, I think we need to be uh, understanding of our design team's perspective um, and their liability risk. Um, and, and if we want to move forward with this, accept that. Um, I also think we need the uh, Conservation Commission ultimately to vote on this um, while I'm again comfortable moving forward it you know they're they're somewhat in the driver's seat on this piece um and they 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 need to get we but we've formally gone on the record with a vote they need to be on the record eventually with a vote as well i i, I know there's some other hands up the only other comment <laughs> that we just want to point out um just so everyone can make an informed decision is that we don't know what the cost is. Um, and and so, you know, 
when we put it out to bid, that's great. You know, we have heard different things, but with the limited pool and availability and where the installers are coming from, et cetera, et cetera, um, we can't with confidence say what the cost of the product's going to be. We'll find out at bid day. <laughs> okay. Um, I so many hands. Doug, let's take you next. Well, it, uh, thank you. Uh, it's interesting that, that, that Donna just mentioned price because I was thinking that, Margaret, you had done a little bit of research and found a difference that you thought was about $100,000 more expensive for the core keen. And so I guess the question becomes if, if um, you know, do we shrink the square footage of the play space uh, if the if the cost is higher, or or do we you know sort of uh, move resources from a different place? So you know what are the, what are our trade off options if if price is is above what uh, what's expected? Because again, you know I think that that when they originally did design, they thought in terms of port and place, much more history with that, much more you know sort of uh, tight sense of what that's going to cost, and that's why you know it's this many dollars and you get fourteen thousand square feet, and we we don't have as much confidence in that. What are our options if, um, if if the resulting bids on on Corkeen, you know, are are noticeably different? Um, yeah. So let me just make a comment about that, and then we'll, I'll I'll pick on some of the other hands. So, you know, I think the the key difference here is I I spoke about the numbers that I mentioned at the last meeting were based on my conversation with the only contractor in Massachusetts, who has bid on the installation of the material and he is subbing it out. He's a lands landscape contractor who is subbing out the installation of the Corkeen to someone else. And the values I gave you his opinion, there is no estimating, our professional estimators have no estimating information on this stuff because it just hasn't been installed regionally. So, but your point is a good one. Uh, Rupert's hand is up. Thanks. I um, uh, I appreciate uh, Denisco's memo there. Uh, in terms of the cons, I also I, it's important to me to look at the long-term consequences uh, beyond any warranty period of three years or five years, years or what have you. When it comes time to do repairs, uh, there are also going to be very limited. Um, opportunities or, or avenues to get repairs done to something where the only licensed installer for Corkeen is, you know, in New Jersey or wherever they are. Uh, so I think that's something to consider potential long-term costs. Sorry, if I could just also respond back to Doug's question, what if um, the price comes in uh, much higher? You know, it really bottom line will be dependent on what the overall contractors um, bid is and and we won't know until after we get the schedule of values from the contractor the dollar value assigned with with this product right um, they don't they just give us a lump sum bid so unfortunately we won't know the devil until later um, we will have some construction contingency if needed to cover the cost, but um, we don't know, Margaret, correct me if you think there's a different way to approach this, but we won't know ultimately what the cost is until the, the contract's awarded and we get a schedule of values. I, I agree with that. Um, Rupert, I, uh, let, me let me take Kathy and Paul's questions. Paul, maybe you go next. And I, I do wanna circle back to the maintenance question you asked last time. Paul? I just want to clarify. So we are being asked as a committee to a, let me just clarify. So Danisco is saying we can't recommend Corkeen as a, uh, as a surface at this point. And you do, but just be clear, you are recommending chrome rubber, right? Um, from, chrome rubber. Port, really port in place rubber. Port in place rubber. Um, that you can't validate or you know confirm or refute the concerns expressed by the conservation commission and board of health, um, but that so as a commit as a co company you're saying we would do um, port in place rubber. Uh, you're asking the question to us is do we want to substitute our judgment for the for the um, 
design team's judgment in this particular case. Um, and I think that that's the question. And I and I think my my response is that if we're forced to by another committee who has voted to say don't do this by regulation or something that that's very really important to me as opposed to them expressing an opinion, which a lot of people have opinions in our community, as we know. So I just I think as a committee, as an elementary school building committee, we have to be very take this question very seriously as to are we willing to substitute our judgment based on the information we have in front of us for the judgment of our professional designers? Is that, I think that's what the question is. Is that accurate, do you think? I think that is a way, that is a way of stating it, yes. Kathy? Um, yeah, Paul, I would just, I would, as Margaret worded her response very carefully, that is a way of staying in it. I think um, when, when I went out and looked at Port in Place, it's just beginning to have any kind of science behind it in terms of been on around and what happens over time. Um, and so the corkeen, because it's cork, is a natural substance. And the what's underneath will not have the same properties. And it's the issue is the tires, that the tires, no one can tell you what tire went into the ground up rubber stuff. And, um, and they, there's a bunch of them out in our backyard because a trucking company dumped all their tires back there. They're there kind of forever um, doing whatever they're doing and not breaking down very much. So, so, so to me, what the design team has come back with is say there are a lot of risks in this because we can't vet the material. We can't say we've installed it before. So we can't tell you what its properties are for a school. Um, and if we, if CONCOM is worried about the risks of PIP and comes strongly for Corkeen, we get, we voted last time to allow that to drive the design team's decision. What I'm hearing now is if that's the route we go, we would, they'd be asking the town to sign a waiver and the waiver would uh, govern the uh, are we sure five years, you know, that it, now the manufacturer is giving you five years, but above that, the design team, five years and installation. So the waiver, as Donna said, would have, the lawyers would have wording in it. And I'm actually comfortable with that um, because I think, I think um, I'm, I think it's not always the worst thing to be first or among the first, if there are reasons to do it. And I do, as Angelica said, the properties of Corkeen in terms of surface temperature, it's it drains really well. It has the same ability to cushion. It has an ability to cushion, not the same, you know, depending on the depth. So um, I'm, I, in my world, I'm willing to make be a risk taker on this kind of thing. But I understand then Doug's piece. I've always thought on some level, we've got a budget for this. And if the Corkeen folks want to get into the New England market, they better come in really close to the price of PIP or or the world is going to say, we're just not going to do it. So there, there is some market pressure on them to say, um, uh, let's do it. So, but I do understand the consequences uh, so I always thought, you know, within some cost constraints. So I'm, I I do think CONCOM has been driving this in that they pulled it out as a concern. Um, based on, uh, there aren't a lot of reports is what I'm saying when you go out and look at the, uh, the research, they pulled it out. And their concern was the drainage through it, not, not the um, surface quality. The performance of it, right. Okay, so Deb, I'm going to call on you and then on Jonathan. I I hate to ask, but could somebody give me a brief uh, explanation why turf is not an option? Synthetic. Um, I think there have been some local issues with synthetic turf. <laughs> uh, I, um, <laughs> I live in a community that ban synthetic turf from our own projects because of the PFAS problems associated with it. 
different chemical, same results. Yeah, but there's also there's also a difference when you're thinking about the material, like what what's the base underneath it, right? You have to have the fall yeah. um, components of it. So so it's not like are we putting grass down versus synthetic turf? We need to have the depth and the cushion for falls and everything. So um, that that would be a little. Uh, probably not the right application for a playground. Thank you. Jonathan. Yeah, I just kind of a, a follow up a little bit to to what Paul was saying. I think the only thing I would add to his description of it is that, you know, we have to acknowledge as a town, not just this committee or or the school board that, that we're taking on the liability um, of choosing or going with a product that's not being supported by our design team. Um, I'm not saying that I'm not uh, recommended. With that. Right, not recommended. Um, and so that, you know, it, the liability there has to be acknowledged to be not just a failure um, down the line, whether that's from the material or the installation, but also potentially the liability of a lawsuit around an injury. Um, you know, that I, I just want to make sure that, that we all kind of acknowledge the decision that we're going to be making um, down the line. You know, other folks will have to deal with this potentially and probably not. You know, I, I think honestly, when I look at the broad spectrum of where the industries are going, you know, we're going to be moving away from some of these these nastier chemicals over time. But at this point in time to choose something that our design team can't can't recommend means that we the building committee, we, the town, are taking on a liability. Angelica? So, Jonathan, when you said that, that was exactly what my first thing that came to mind is, what about lawsuits? What about the liability? But then my then thought was, um, do we have existing lawsuits or any, do we have a sense of current liability? Because as a parent who takes the kid, uh, two kids to Mill River, for instance, where there is very little ground and it's constantly moving, away because of the wood um it's like the kids know it's like <laughs> you're on your own with that be careful when you're going off the so there's already like a sense of a high liability and i'm wondering if there's any presidents of any parents that have sued say because of the liability in, in the mill river playground or others that have the wood where it's basically kids jumping into the ground and it's pretty not good for impact um angelica i'm rick just to hold on that hold you for a second i mean i think there the answer is yes but i mean i think the difference is there's a different form of liability when you're doing something brand new than the maintenance of an existing facility and the responsibility for the brand new thing kind of rests with this group um and with the town i would say in a different way rick calling on you Yes, uh, I'm doubling back on when we'd know what the uh, price for Corkine might be. And it just occurred to me uh, in the I think in this in this setting, uh, it was discussed the possibility of, of of doing an alternate between the the two products. and the the sticking point was with that was always, comparing Corkeen to a rubber surface that the Conservation Commission wouldn't allow. So to what end uh, could that happen? Uh, but it also occurred to me that uh, the bidding statutes allows the awarding authority to make things other than the standard file subbid categories of file subbid. And we could make Corkeen as a proprietary product a file sub bid and we have uh so on bid day we would be comparing that against our estimate for the surfacing for the playground and at that point in time we have flexibility to say that uh depends on how the bids come in but there's at least it's it's a it should give us a number 
and when receiving bids, you have flexibility. You could say it's out of budget and we redesign and then you give the general contractor a, a number to carry. And then the redesign simply could be reducing the area of the core keen and rebidding and rebidding that to get that number closer to what we want. So that's an avenue that we could control the cost without waiting to find out who the general contractor bought it from when he gives us a schedule of values 30 days after he's been signed. Alicia? Um, thank you. So I think I, I definitely understand the design team's um, hesitation or just quite literal inability to recommend this um, and understanding that you all have not worked with this before and understanding why that would mean that there would be some sort of liability. Um, but I do think that in terms of the CONCOM decision and also the um, the weighing in of the Board of Health, that there were experts and there were evidence. Those decisions were based off of expert um, advice and also evidence um, and that they do have a better you know, understanding or ability to look at these things as they are and they're still developing. So I also understand that. Um, but I think considering those, the feedback that we've gotten from those committees, as well as some of the different advantages that we've known and we've talked about, that it would make sense for us to move forward. And I think it would also make sense to just have the liability waiver um, to cover the design team since you all have not worked with this before. Um, but I would be in favor of of seeing if we can move forward with the core key and also understanding that there may be some cost differences. But I know we talked about contingencies and the possibility of some of the bids coming in under anyhow. And so I think that we can sort of address that on the other end. So I'm wondering, um, so I'm in favor of moving forward with Corkeen, but my question is, um, is there a date, like does this decision have to happen today? Um, and if not, when is the deadline um, that this needs to happen in order for us to not sort of delay any processes moving forward? So Alicia, I, um, I think the answer to that is complicated. Let me hear Paul's question and then let's go back and talk through this, the schedule issue. Paul? Uh, well, I, I support um, Alicia's question. When do we have to make a decision on it? And I'm just sort of from my hat is I'm on this committee because I'm the town manager. And so the things I bring are three things. One is about liability. My job is to minimize liability. And it's the, this is a concern for me because we are accepting li the designers are very expl explicit. You make a decision, you take on liability. Are we comfortable with that? That's question one. Question two is about for, for, uh, things. other things I consider is price. Um, when you go to a proprietary product, I, I don't buy, I, I, you know, I don't think if they know that they're the only bidder, they're going to come in with the price they want to put on it. There's not an option. There's only one company. There's one installer in New Orleans or wherever they're from. Um, I think that that's a concern for me in terms of whenever you choose a proprietary product, I think that's a concern. And along with that, um, and then the third Third thing is uh, sort of installation and maintenance. I mean, if not show, not knowing if there are many people. If you know, with our um, our the playground at um, Groff Park, we've had somebody light a fire on it and left a big hole, and there was a, an installer ready to come back and fix it right away. So it wasn't a big big deal. What does it take when there's maintenance issues or repair issues for a new surface? I don't know the answer to the question. So it's those it's liability, it's price, and then it's installation and maintenance and i guess um if we're i have not seen what the board what the conservation conservation commission is our permitting group if mm -hmm. they said you cannot use poured in place rubber i want them to vote that i think that's important if they're going to say that to us they need to say it because that has broader implications to every institution in this town um public and private i know it's all sort of circumstantial in terms of where the where the water flows. They're really concerned about something getting into the water. So if you're on top of a hill, it probably doesn't matter to them. But I just think that um, if they feel strongly about it and I, you know, then they should take a vote on it and saying, we, you can't use this material here. And that, that would be very influential to me. So those are my concerns. So let me, um, let me talk a little bit about 
my perspective on the um, repair issue, because this circles back to the thing that um, Rupert brought up at the last meeting. So um, I think um, as I addressed in my memo from a couple of months ago, you know, there right now <clears throat> there is one licensed installer that we know of and they're they are in New Orleans. If you use so I'm using license, their their copyrighted term is brand master. If we use <laughs> if if at the time this is bid, the only licensed installer is this company in New Orleans. And there is a warranty. Whoever that installer is, they would be required to come from New Orleans to repair, do repairs under the five-year warranty. Um, the warranties for port in place rubber are often, but not always longer. It is definitely tied up with you know, who the installer is. It's my belief that this product is probably going to expand fairly quickly in this market. <laughs> but at the moment, you know, it, so there are other people could get trained to be brand masters. They won't ever have done an installation of it. So there's a there's a balancing act between, you know, could other people bid? I certainly hope so. Do we want to pre-qualify the the bidder for this material to be someone who's done it before? Probably also. So uh, you know, I just say say that to say. Um, I think there will be other people who could do repair work in the future in the area, but for the purposes of making sure that you had the warranty and it was by someone who installed it at the moment, as best I know, there's one installer. So let's go back to your other comments. So I don't disagree with you that the Conservation Commission, prob we probably need to go back to them and, and get sort of firm direction, but everything I heard at that meeting leads me to believe that they would be, they stopped just short, I would say, of actually taking a vote. And that was just because they had decided not to take a vote on anything at the meeting. And then we asked them to separate the two issues um, because we needed the order of conditions to move forward with the bidding. So let's return to the issue of schedule. Um, Rick, you know, I, I think what you laid out is an, an interesting variation of the, the bid process, mm -hmm. but I would have thought that Denisco would have wanted a real commitment on this sooner so as not to be having to do redesign um, at a later date. And, and maybe you're suggesting that as a sort of plan B but I would like to hear what plan A is from Denisco. What is your preference here for being able to create a set of coordinated uh, drawings for bidding? Our, our preference would be, well, as, as Tim mentioned, we're moving along with the playground design uh, we need to final. We're on track to finalizing that in March, uh, and with that, any allowances made for what the what Bill Brown thinks he's going to be comfortable with for um, resilience. Uh, we could make that decision, assuming that it's going to be um, core keen and. I mean, like I said, it just affects perhaps some of the heights or some of the things that you think about. And I, I don't have at my fingertips everything. My suggestion for doing it as a as a file sub bid wasn't as much as uh, uh, kicking the can down the road and redesigning. It was so that the committee would know on bid day the the price of Corkeen uh and hopefully the pro the bids that they the project can afford all the things that can very likely happen uh when you're the only game in town. 
uh, you know, and and the design mm -hmm. the design change could simply be making the area smaller because we have that latitude. We could make that area smaller now as a hedge uh, against it, which is I think some of the latitude that we were given at the last meeting. But it wasn't to necessarily to to throw it open and then have to rethink about it. It was just trying to deal with the uh, knowing what the product cost as early as possible. Now, having said that and thinking about the ramifications of that, if it's a foul sub bid, we have to pre-qualify them. Mm -hmm. And if we have to pre-qualify them, uh, we have to somehow in the pre-qualification make it clear or, or, or name the section resilient cork playground surfacing so we're not pre-qualifying hip people that never uh, installed it. And then we're pre-qualifying whoever is an approved installer you know, in about two months time, which maybe the people in, in um, the grandmasters aren't going to bother with some right. Massachusetts uh, procedure if uh, they don't have to. Right. So that's what I was thinking, Rick. So yeah. we're kind of going down this rabbit hole of pre-qualification, but um, they have to be DCAM certified. Who knows if they are? They could be like the elevators and the elevator they're, people they're, choose they're not, not to. They're so, not. So, so yeah. we, we can make student. an attempt to do that. But as Rick's talking through this, um, I, I think let's just take that off the table. And I think please, <laughs> there, there was a question. There was a question that I'm not sure we necessarily answer. Now I forget what it was but um we, uh, when or why uh, you know i we could go around and around and kick the can down the road a little bit further but ultimately we want as much time to be able to document whatever it is that we need to document for our 90 percent bid documents which are coming up right margaret we said that's yep. going out um, april april 26th april. So yeah. I don't, I don't know what the next steps are if we don't take a vote today. Um, is is there an opportunity to go back to conservation commission to to Paul's point and say, are you making us do this? Um, I think what they said was we don't want you to use port in place. They're not saying to use core keen. That's um, right. Or and and they're not saying and and the building committee has already voted down the engineered wood fiber. So, yeah. you, you know, does the building committee reverse their decision on engineered wood fiber? I don't want to go there. I'm just I'm just trying to think this all through. Um, or do we stay firm on that because there are maintenance and accessibility issues and all other issues why we chose not to move forward with engineered wood fiber um and and just remain on port in place versus corking so i see uh, unfortunately ellison's, i see ellison's hand is up and i also just want to do a time check with people um am i it is um, by my watch it's 10 27 can people stay a bit longer than 10 30 because we have invoices mm -hmm. and people need to be paid so we yep. um so i we need to keep okay looks like we can okay uh allison i don't think my comment will be helpful or my question i just um when it comes to corkeen it seems like we are talking about a lot of things that are very um, unsure and unknown. And if I was a, a, pr a producer of Corkeen, I would probably give you a number that you would agree to up front and then load in the costs on the back end when it comes to maintenance and repairs that you have to go through me on. So I just, mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of things that were just mentioned when Donna did a nice summary there. So I, there were some things I didn't understand necessarily. 
But if we are going down that route, I would like to make sure that any agreements we have are trying to help us make sure that we're looking at costs that are similar to port in place when it comes to maintenance, when it comes to repairs. Mm -hmm. um, since it sounds like our, our options in terms of um, providers is so limited. So they have us kind of over a barrel in terms of time in um, being able to work with them. Um, it, it Like financially, this seems like a really un wise decision. Um, but I also understand the concerns that uh, people who are in favor of it. And I am very concerned with the idea of going back to engineered, engineered wood fiber, because I already have a playground that's inaccessible to my children who have wheelchairs. So I'd love to have something that is accessible, because that's a daily need, as opposed to some of the other port in place, um, you know, the concerns around port in place, which is very long term. I'm I'm in the middle of the daily need of having an accessible playground today. Okay, I see Jonathan's hand is up. So I, I would say that <clears throat> I guess the thing I would I have to one's a question, one's a comment. I'll do the comment first. Uh we have to be accessible. We cannot build a new school and not be accessible. Um so I, I don't think I to me I don't think we can go back and consider the wood fiber, any form of wood fiber again. Um, and the question is the vote that we took at a prior meeting, and now I can't even remember if it was the last one or the one before that, um, on this topic, <clears throat> what would, what did we vote on? What, you know, what did we commit ourselves to? Um, and can that vote stand or do we need to actually have a new vote? And I don't know that we had voting, do we have voting on our agenda? We don't have voting on the agenda, but what the way, the way I think of this is you vote you voted initially to um, not use engineered wood fiber in in favor of port in place rubber um, because of its access its superior accessibility qualities. Um, at the last meeting, you voted to allow the design committee subject to their consideration to use Corkeen. They've come back and said, we can't recommend this, but if the city provides us a liability of uh, a waiver of waiver liability, of liability yeah. we are willing to use it. Okay. So I'm, I'm not, I think, I, I'm not sure you can take a vote because honestly, I think Paul has got to go to the legal department and say, can we do this? But I think if you were going to take a vote, it would be to ask Paul to do that. And maybe that's really just kind of a show of hands, not that's necessarily not sure a vote, vote, right? I mean, it, it's yeah. it's a it's a process piece, right? So if if the town were willing to do that, then I would go back to Concom and say, we really need you to formalize a decision about this that clarifies that it is for this site only. What's the legal question, Margaret? Whether the town is willing to provide the li the waiver of liability that Danisco is looking. For. I think that's a policy question, probably not a legal question. Okay, well, it's the town has to make a policy decision about that. And I, I guess I would say I, you know, I, I don't know that I'd be feel comfortable voting on anything today because it's just a little too nebulous as to what we'd be voting on. I agree. Um, and I, I really think the other town committee needs to commit to what the issue is and, and, and vote on that. And then yep. we can react to that. And and we did, Jonathan, in the motion um, that I wrote on the the fly, but it had to meet to meet CONCOM's concerns. So it it specifically anchored it in the other committee rather than just throwing it up in the air that the design team had to make a decision for us. Right. So this, they've come back with us. So it, are people so, okay? I think, yeah, I think we need to move on. I just want to make a comment um, in, in passing that the Board of Health also took this up um, and um, made, took an advisory vote to avoid the use of materials that contained um, the kinds of materials that are in port in place rubber. It's not specific, doesn't say port in place rubber, but, and it was an advisory opinion because they are an advisory group, but uh, just to uh, make sure that everybody's in the loop about that. 
So I think we need to close this discussion for now. I think it'll be back on the agenda for the next meeting. And I think we have some actions to take. So I wanna to touch really quickly, just to let you know, um, it's somewhat related. There is a vote that is required for the design team to include proprietary materials um, in the project. And I'm gonna put the list up quickly. Um, Tim or Rick, could you kind of quickly, this list is based on the needs of the district, mostly in this case coming from Rupert. Could you just quickly review this? Because this will be on the agenda of the next school committee meeting. And we will probably, depending on, we'll probably add Corkeen to this list um, as, a, as a possible proprietary item. And this is, and that, I just want to clarify, this is not our vote, it's the school committee. It's not your vote, it's just to let you know that this is in, in process. So Rick or Tim, could you talk about this quickly and then we'll do invoices. Sure, uh, one of the things that we do early on is we talk with folks such as Rupert who are uh, involved with uh, maintaining multiple buildings and reviewing uh, components and systems that have to work with other buildings or that they have to service uh, district-wide uh, and see if there are any items that should be uh, proprietary. Uh, there, and we've talked about proprietary and, and its effect on cost. I have to say that uh, none of the items on here are items that are budget busters by by being proprietary uh, and the security and uh, having a, a universal uh, key system for door locks is a typical item uh, as is uh, hardware von Duprin and Schlag entry and exit hardware for uh, spare parts stocking and service uh, and the security system uh tends to be head end uh type of equipment and universal among buildings so yeah. nothing under the security or the door access and is at all uh untypical energy management system it's just a request for controllers and not an entire system so that's not a big ticket item and then the public address system uh being a a, a system manufactured by by Bogan um, to be in line with other things that are are in the district. So this is a very typical uh, list without any uh, real red flags on it. It's MSBA's requirement that uh, an elected body vote the list, which is why it's going to the school committee and not this committee. Thank you, Rick. Does anybody have any questions about that? It's it's informational. Um, Doug, Doug, Doug has his hand up. Just send it to me so I can make sure to get it on the agenda for the school committee. Yes. In fact, I've spoken to Sarah Marshall about this to fill her in, and I'm going to send her materials for the packet. So thank you. Okay. Ksenia, you're up. You coming right up. Okay, here we go. I'll go as quickly as I can given the time constraints and thank you for staying for this. Everybody on the team appreciates getting paid. Um, the This month's invoice package um, includes the OPM, the design team, um, the uh, Bid Docs Online is a the website that hosted the bid process for the early site package, and you'll see them again for the main GC, and, and Elm Electric, who did some small electrical work during the gas line relocation um, <clears throat> to deal with some conflicts between the path of the trench and electrical um, wiring existing in the ground. The total of the package is $417,051.96. Uh, 
of which 77,500 is for answer advisory, um, which is a 3% advancement on um, the previous 15% expenditure of that contract. The balance for both the OPM and the design team includes services that will last through the entire construction uh, period. Um, Danisco has three invoices, um, a 5% advancement, um, bringing them up to 51% complete, 338, 315, 73, for a value of $750 for the bid docs online hosting of the early site package and 441 dollars for um electric. Um if Everybody isn't interested in me scrolling every page of this. Please stop me in the interest of time, but I will do so. So this is answer. Advertisement, Danisco. Again, please pause me if you so feel that's the last page. The end. Yeah, well, well done, Cassandra. Thank you. Okay, I'm, and we I, recommend I'm, this for approval. Thank you. I move to approve the bids as presented. And and I second it. And I just want to make a comment, um, particularly for Deb, since she's new. My understanding is the town is regularly vetting these. You know, in other words, this is um, the reason we don't have to scrutinize every single line in it, number one, there's an overall budget for this and uh, people are looking at it to make sure there's nothing, there's no surprises on the list. So we are, we're voting on something that's part of a larger system. Thank you. Yeah, they're reviewed and recommended by us, then presented to Jennifer and Bob and you are, they're coming to you after that review. So I will take um, go around the room to take a vote. And this is on the invoices. Um, Simone. Yes. Jennifer. Yes. Jonathan. Yes. Paul. Yes. Deb. Yes. Doug. Yes. Rupert. Yes. Allison. Yes. Angelica. Yes. Alicia. Yes. And Kathy is a yes. Um, it's unanimous with, I think, just one person missing. We okay. do. Have, we do. We have one vacancy, and Paul will. Interviews have happened, and Paul will be, over the next few time periods, fill the one slot. Phoebe, as I think everyone knows, resigned from the committee in January. So is there anything else before I open it up for public comments? And I will try to uh, alert people that we need to keep it short since we're running over. I don't see any hands. So we are open for public comments. So, Rudy, I have brought you in and allowed you to talk. Hi, thank you. Hey, can you hear me? All right. Yes. Yeah. Just okay, so people great. know, there's I'll... one, two, three, four, five. There's six people in our audience right now. Uh, I'll make this quick. It's more of a comment. Um, it's come to my attention that uh, with respect to the peer review subcontract, which was tied to a checklist that would be cross-checked against the so-called owner's project requirements in order to decide whether the project was on track to meet our net zero bylaw. Um, and I had asked for some months back a copy of or a link to the owner's project requirements so that we could see what those were because that was purportedly the energy criteria for the project, essentially that the peer reviewer would check our design against to make sure we are on track. Um, I subsequently learned fairly recently that that owner's project requirements document was never really prepared. So the sub the peer review subcontract is a little bit floating in the void in my view. Um, there's nothing to check back against. And I, I'm not sure this can be corrected now, but as we do lessons learned from this project, 
of how to conduct ourselves so that we meet the net zero bylaw requirements and we have a good way for the peer reviewer to cross check against the energy estimates for the project done by the design team. We should make sure that we have an owner's project uh, requirements document prepared early in the design process. I think we should probably be tagging that to the energy budget um, defined under the bylaw and sort of ma either make them the same document or make them linked documents. And I just, I raise this now because I wanna make sure as we do sort of lessons learned, um, we make sure and take care of that shortcoming here. And if there's some way to fix this as we go forward with our peer review in the next few months, it would be good to have some kind of patch for this. And I hope we see the next iteration of the peer review contract so we know we're on track for the net zero building performance under our bylaw. So thanks very much. Thank you, Rudy. Uh, next we have, whoops. Mm, I th Maria. Hi there. Can you guys hear me? I'm on a different device than usual. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm commenting about the core team. Um, uh, you guys have received a lot of stuff from me. I'll send something more comprehensive, but um, I really do hope that we move forward core keen. I think it is, uh, I, I won't dwell on this because I know you guys are short on time, um, but it, aside from having a warranty um, and, installation uh, manufacturers and installers having to m test the product at different heights and confirm that it is safe to ASTM 1292 standards. Um, you know, I, I think that we would be fine with this. And this is used in Scandinavian countries. And I, I, I hope that we can be leaders in this for our to be consistent with our net zero building um, and not have um, you know, rubber port in place that is going to put the Port River um, uh, at risk of having contaminants. And it, it provides the safety and accessibility we need. So uh, I, I dearly hope that we that we use Quirking. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. So um, I brought in one other person, but it's Davidson, but I'm not sure your hand was up. No, he, he's, he's with our team. Sorry, okay. Kathy. So it was Joel, just Joel my, cur my, my cursor hover hovered. That's okay. I'm getting Unless Joel good, wants I'm to not, say I'm something. Not, <laughs> I'm not perfect on it. Thank you. So I think I think um, unless I see anyone's hand go up, um, we are adjourned. And I just want everyone to know that I'll, I will make sure that Rick sends me the pictures. Uh, that were that, that he showed today so we can put it in the packet so particularly for people like Deb you know just I, when I went to search for what does the whole thing look like I didn't have the most recent one so now that the we've moved some of the um, canopies to provide this overdrop which I think is a terrific design thing so they they will get put in the packet um, um, and you can download them if you want to so I thank everyone for participating. Please let me know in between times if you have any questions or comments, um, I will try to get them answered. Have a good Enjoy morning. school vacation week next week. Yes. yes. We are. Have, have a great week off. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye.